I guess that if we do something, whether it's on video, text, or talk, and we don't want our mother listening to it, we hope that we don't have to describe it in public court. But that happened today to Brian Higgins. Brian had to read flirty texts with a woman who was in a relationship and that the boyfriend died soon after. The day did end with something that really hurt the state, and we'll see how Lally recovers from it on Tuesday. Welcome to the Roundup, True Crime with Mike. Here I give you an update to current cases so you can quickly catch up on today's or this week's happenings on some public cases. We were talking about Day 17 in the Karen Reed trial. Before we get into the text exchanges that made everyone cringe, let's first talk about Brian Higgins and his direct testimony with Lally. This is another big day people were looking forward to. Higgins has been presented as another person who may have possibly been the one to beat up John O'Keefe. People even went to say that, that the feds would show up in court today and either arrest Brian Higgins or that Brian would finally come clean and he would say that he beat up John. But none of that happened, and Brian Higgins started with his direct testimony. Brian was asked where he works, and he is with the federal ATF department. Prior to that, he was at the Canton Fire Department. On January 28th, he was at a funeral in New York, and then he drove back with Brian Albert, Kevin Albert, and Eddie Hernandez. He talks about how he went to the Canton Police Department and dropped off his work vehicle and picked up his cheap Wrangler with the snowplow on it. He then met Brian at the Hillside Bar, had a few Jamesons and Gingers, and then went to the waterfall. At the waterfall, he saw John and Karen, but not, did not really interact with them. He said there was an open invitation to go, to go back to the Alberts where they went. When he got there, he did an initial plow of the driveway and parked his Jeep in front of the mailbox. He went inside where Brian Jr. was there with another lady or two. He said that Brian Sr. showed up uh, and showed him some pictures of Brian Jr. who was in the Marine Corps. Brian said he left between 1231 and went over to the Canton Police Department to move some vehicles so that the plows would have access. In the morning, he was woken up at 630 by a call, and then a second call was from Brian Albert saying that John had been found in the lawn. He went over to the Alberts, and then he said he wasn't sure where he went. He was asked if he saw Karen or John at the Alberts, and he did not. And then we get to the salacious part of the day. Though first Brian was asked about his text with John over January, there wasn't too much there. But when we got to the text with Karen, this is what happened. Brian had to read most of the text he had with Karen. Unfortunately, reading the text went on for like 30 or more minutes, so I can't show you all of it. But let's start with the first first text from Karen to Brian, and here is the picture. Brian goes into explaining how the first time they really talked, that Brian saw Karen, she was doing some weed whacking, and Brian said hi, and she gave him the one finger salute back. The nickname stuck with her. Brian said things heated up later when he went over to John's house to watch a Patriots game. Let's listen. I don't. I honestly can't tell you which door that was. If it it was it was either the the, the breezeway or the garage. And as you were going out, um, again, I'm sorry. What happened? The defendant kissed me. And how did she kiss you? Not like a friend. Um, but he says that he and Karen were outside later. And Karen kissed, and then it was more than a peck. So over the course of the next 10 days or so, there were texts back and forth where it was like two people decided whether or not they would have an affair. They talked about the kiss some, and then they talked about what they wanted, but never fully carried it out. Brian said there was one time that Karen came over, and they talked about maybe what could happen, but nothing happened, and she left. Also, the text talked about how, how she didn't like the kids, and she had it. And she had in the relationship with John. It would be very tough to have to read those texts in court knowing that you were potentially going to have an affair with a guy that would end up dead. These days the text could show motive for both parties. One potentially was that Brian may have wanted more, but that she didn't want that. But it also showed a few things about Karen. She was upset at John and that sh she thought John cheated on her in Aruba. She didn't like the kids and that she was ready to move on. The last quote to Karen to Karen to Brian was John died.
Brian finished up his direct. Jackson started with asking if Brian brought his attorney with him to court that day and why he would need a lawyer. The irony coming from a lawyer. He then went into how many police friends and how close Brian was with all the people involved. Jackson wanted to know if Brian was sexually attracted to Karen, which he finally said yes. Then the focus got on to what Brian did on the 29th and all the time he spent at the police station that day. They went through the times he badged in and out, starting early in the morning and throughout the day. Jackson also asked if Brian was there when the car was brought into the Sally Port. At the end of the day came the most important part, and Karen's defenders will probably say it's a bombshell. Let's listen to the summary from Karen's lawyer. Personal gain. The specifics of that testimony have been as follows. He indicated that he contacted Matt Kelsch, a federal agent. He indicated that he utilized a federal facility. It was, he called it an unsecure facility, but it's federal, a f- federal facility notwithstanding. And that the two of them, he and Agent Kelch, utilized a federal res- utilized federal resources in the form of some kind of a machine, as the, the witness indicated, for his own personal gain, so that he could, as a witness, in no official capacity, working any official case, and in, in Matt Kelch's capacity as a as an individual rather than an agent, they both work together to download certain information from the witness's phone in anticipation of turning that highly selected, highly curated information over to law enforcement so that he could later ultimately destroy his phone, which this witness, in fact, did. Okay, so it's not in time. Brian had a friend who had worked with the ATF in forensics, and he asked him if he would help him get the text messages off in this case. But after getting that, Brian said he upgraded his phone and destroyed the SIM card. And that's where court ended in fr- on Friday. It was big news late, and the jurors have three days to think about it. This weekend is Memorial Day, so be safe out there. There was court in the Karen Reed trial only on Tuesday, so I will do an update then. Since I'm going to Crime Con next week, it will be the only episode next week. Have a safe and hop- happy three-day weekend.